for me is about a half hour ago, I feel like already a kitchen. Uh, as if he's almost a brother of mine. And, um, that's definitely the way I felt uh, as I traveled uh, over the last, uh, I would say, 20 or 30 years uh, to, to the Muslim world and to different parts of it. Um, and um, one thing Pervez and I have in common is Pakistan. I lived there briefly. Uh, in 93, 94, I taught there uh, at Punjab University in the city of Lahore. Um, and as a journalist, but as a kind of, I, I want to say quasi-academic, uh, I've studied, uh, I did a fellowship at Oxford University where I studied the influence of Islamic architecture. And um, I've written a lot about music uh, as a journalist. Um, and so my, my background is really someone who's curious about different um, areas and the way in a sense, people and cultures connect. Um, even if, even if at the higher level, people are saying we are disconnected. So um, that that's that's always been my, uh, in a sense, my um, my outlook is to look for ways that people are connected, even though governments and and leaders may say we're not connected and we shouldn't be connected. Uh, so I, um, I I did write the book. Actually, I, I'm writing the book now, but I, I wrote this book in 2008 called All America Travels to America's Terror and Islamic Roots. And it was one of the first books, and I think it's still the only book that addresses the historic um, interconnectedness between the Arab and Muslim world in the United States. Now, I wrote this book because I, because, um, I was frustrated at not being able, at not seeing these connections articulated in the popular media. And when I say popular media, I mean, you know, television, and to a lesser extent, but to a similar extent, um, newspapers and... Oh, thank you. Is this, is this better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I, I'm not gonna repeat what I said earlier. Uh, I, did everyone hear me well enough? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I'm not going to repeat what I said earlier, but I, I will just say that um, so, so part, part of my background is that I just, I'm a little bit distrustful, distrustful of what politicians say about the Middle East. A little bit, if not more than a little bit. Or anything else. <laughs> or anything else, right. And, and, and so, um, and, and as a journalist, I'm trained to sort of step back from events and to ask questions about, well, why, why is that? And why, why is not that? So, um, Islam has the. Oh, yeah. Is that is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, so so. Okay. Thank you. So so um, in my in my research for my book, I found that um, the Islamic world, Islam, has been with America from America's founding, and that was a surprise for me to find that out. Especially in the wake of um, this, you know, tragic event, and this, of course, is 9/11, and you can see the twin tower buildings um, on fire uh, about to collapse. But um, and so, so, one of the things I found in my research is that, you know, the, the connection between the Muslim world and America is so profound and so deep that people aren't, in a sense, people aren't even aware um, of these connections. Partly because of the media, I think. Partly because the media doesn't talk about these connections, partly because a lot of politicians say there are no connections, or they don't know themselves about these connections. And so, in a sense, what I found in my book is that these connections, I won't say have been whitewashed from history, but in a sense, it's more of benign neglect. They've been, you know, um, kind of shunt, shunted aside because for, for, for other things. And so, 9-11, though, you get, of course, a lot of extremism, and you get, um, you know, you know. I mentioned the media. You get people posting at media sites like ABC News saying, you know, the Islamic uh, way of life and their culture must be eradicated. And when I saw that, you know, in my research, I was personally offended. And of course, we're offended by things like this. And of course, we're offended by things like this after 9/11. Some um, American taking it out on an immigrant Muslim family from from Pakistan in Dallas. But I realized, you know, what, what, part of the reason that there's this culture of Muslim hatred is that it begins, in some sense, at the governmental level, and in some sense, at the um, educational and academic level. And I don't know how many of you know this book called The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order, but it's by Samuel P. Huntington. And he said in his book, 
A multicultural America is, is impossible because a non-Western America is not American. Now, um, one thing you should know about Samuel P. Huntington is that he was an advisor to the Bush administration and that they listened to him resolutely. Now, I'm not saying that Samuel P. Huntington, you know, in a sense, led to this backlash against American Muslims, but we can't ignore people like Samuel P. Huntington when we look at the backlash. We can't say these are isolated incidents. We have to say these are connected in some ways to other things, and this is one other thing that I think was too often ignored after 9-11. After um, and, you know, of course, I wrote this book when Barack Obama was, was trying to become U.S. president, and at one point, um, in 2008, he was, uh, this was his political opponent, John McCain. At one point in 2008, somebody at a McCain rally says, you know, Obama's Arab. And McCain says, oh, no, ma'am, he's a decent family man. <laughs> and, and, and some people said, oh, look, he's defending. But no, actually, in a sense, to me, this is where, in, the, in popular American culture, Arab and Muslim is a buzzword for he's, you know, fill in the blank. My mother might say Meshuggah, but um, you know you could you could you could fill in all sorts of names. He's a blank. So to me, no, that that that's that's this was a bad sign of the culture for me. And of course, it extends into 2010. We have Sarah Palin um, um, manufacturing, helping to manufacture controversy around a mosque that was supposed to be built in Lower Manhattan. And then in 2000, actually no, this is right this year. We have Donald Trump, you know, somebody says, we have, a, you know, one of his rallies, we have a promised country, it's called Muslims, we know our current president is one, and Donald Trump's reaction is right. He's, he's not, he doesn't say, well, no, uh, for, first of all, what's your problem? You know, he doesn't say that, it's more like he, he's getting along with this right-wing, uh, excuse, excuse my language, maybe, uh, um, audience member, then we have Ben Carson saying he would never support a Muslim candidate for president. So my, my book, in a sense, was to say, wait a minute, you know, let's put a stop to all this and look at, look at the history of Islam in America. That's what I wanted to do. And so I wanted to start by looking at the history of Islam. And I wanted to start in actually in Muslim Spain, because in a sense, this is where Islam in America starts. We had, of course, you know, um, Muslim rule over Spain for about 700 years. And in the year 1492, after what was called, now called the Reconquista, um, you know, Muslim rule over lower parts of Spain uh, ended. And so this is, this is a depiction of the surrender of Granada, Spain in January 2nd, 1492. Now, we all know in our history books that something else happened in 40, 1492. Uh, something very big. And that was this man, Christopher Columbus, landing in the Bahamas. Not the, not the literal man, now is the United States, but the Bahamas. And so that happened in 1492. And what, what the Reconquista was about, and what Columbus, his journey was about, in a sense, was about expanding empire. It was about expanding the Spanish empire. But it was also about getting rid of Muslims in Spain. And also, by the way, Jews. Jews in Spain, but that's another story. Um, the, the, the Reconquista and, and Christopher Columbus's journey was about expanding Spain's power without Muslims. Spain, Spain in fact, banned they banned Muslims from going to what they called the New World. If you were a Muslim, you could not travel with Columbus. And you could not travel on any journeys to America unless you were a devout uh, uh, Christian. Now, one of the ironies I found in my book is that Spain, of course, because of 700 years of Spanish rule, was a sense, essentially an Arabized country, was a, a Muslim country culturally. And so, Columbus's title, the very title that he, you know, uh, devoted himself to, was Al Marante de Mar Oceano. Uh, that's how he signed his his name, Al, Al Marante. Now, Al Marante de, is derives from the Arabic word El Amir, which means the commander, and it means the commander of the ocean, ocean sea. So, in a sense, Columbus himself was using Arabized Spanish, but to get to the New World, he also relied on Arabic knowledge including, you know, uh, decades, decades and decades of um, these triangular-shaped uh, sails that Arab navigators were using for, for years before um, Spanish navigators adapted them. And, and without these sails, Columbus would not have made it to America as quickly. These are the older sails, these more square sails that they used. And of course, Columbus relied on Arabic um, knowledge in terms of astronomy and um, Al-Fardani, um, was a famous 9th, 9th century astronomer whose um, 
guidelines for how to navigate the world Columbus relied on. And here's one of the things I dug out in my research, and that is Fernando Columbus saying, there are five reasons, top five reasons Columbus made it to America. Fifth was Alfred Gunn. Fifth with Alfred Gunn. Now, um, Columbus, and I found this in an obscure book, Columbus actually thanked, you know, there's this, there's this perception that Columbus and Spain were entirely against Muslims, which, which they sort of were, actually. But, but it gets complicated. It gets complicated, because here's Columbus saying in 1501, about a decade after, after you know, quote, unquote, discovering America, you know, ever since so far traversed, I have sailed, I have conversed and exchanged ideas uh, with learned men, church and laymen, Latins and Greeks, Jews and Moors. Moors meaning Muslims. So here's Columbus flat out saying he's indebted to Muslims. Now, this, this is not very well known in any history book I read when I was a kid, uh, nor afterwards, you know, frankly, till the time I found this in, a, in an obscure book. But what I found, essentially, was a whole history of Columbus relying on Muslim knowledge and, and Muslims personally to get to America. And so, in a sense, America is indebted to Muslims, is indebted to this interconnectedness that Columbus, um, you know, learned from in Spain. Now, this, this connection between America, Columbus, and Islam, and Islamic knowledge is not very well known. And, um, you know, I, I, this is one of the things that I wanted my book to kind of, uh, you know, elucidate on, to, to, to announce. Um, but I didn't want to stop there. I did not want to stop there. I wanted to go back to Spain. And, if you, and those of you who have been to Spain, you know about the Alhambra, this really incredible um, Spanish palace and, and mosque, essentially, um, in, in Granada. And architecturally, when you go to the Spain, you see this beautiful um, work above doorways. This is called, in architectural terms, Alf and Alfines, A-L-F-I-Z. Um, now, um, you know, you find, again, you find this everywhere, but I was surprised to find this Islamic architecture in the Alamo. Now, the Alamo is one of these iconic, you know, American buildings. American kids who grew up, you know, they're weird, you know, they always, they always learn the history of the Alamo because of what it represents. It represents the expansion of America, uh, you know, over uh, Mexican territory, right? And and millions of people passed under that doorway. But what they don't realize is that again, above that doorway is an alfiz that takes its architectural dimensions from the Alhambra. And this is one of the ironic things: Spain, when they came to the New World, did not allow Muslims, but they did allow Muslim architecture. They wanted it. And in fact, the, Al the Alamo is part of a series of Spanish missions, Spanish missions um, that have Islamic architectural influence. And so when you go to the Alamo, no one, no one is handing you out literature saying, welcome to the Islamic-inspired Alamo, salam alaikum. <laughs> they, they don't say that at all. And, and so I dug, I dug this out, again, through obscure research. I had to find this out through obscure research, spending lo lots of late nights in, in libraries. Um, but when I was in the Alamo in San Antonio, I went to one of the sister missions, and, and, and it's called Mission San Jose, and this, this, is, this is it. This, this, now, this is what it looked like when it was first built, uh, you know, centuries ago. Now, I, I, I'm hearing some wows, and, and I think I know why. Because if you go back to Spain, and if you go to Cordoba, and you go to the Grand Mosque in Cordoba, that's the architectural style that you see. That's, 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 in a sense, it's a trademark of Islamic architecture for that time period in Spain, for that time period in Spain. So it goes back centuries, right? But again, when you go to San Antonio, Texas, you realize, wow, Spain brought over Islamic architecture, even though people don't know that. And this is the shame to me. This is, all, all the examples I'm going to show you are examples of how the is, Islam has been disconnected from, from American roots. And I'm trying to reconnect. I, my book is trying to reconnect those roots. But this, this to me, was a stunning example. Stunning, yes. Did you put Spain there on purpose, or by? Oh, yeah. That's, uh, no, that's my, my bad. <laughs> San, San Antonio, Texas. But I actually, no, you're right. Thank, thank you. <laughs> I sort of like San Antonio, Spain better, actually. <laughs> um, and so, um, when, um, any, anyone want to guess where this is? Thank you, yeah, this is New Orleans. When I went to New Orleans for research for, for my book, this is 2007, I was really surprised to walk around New Orleans and realize, wow, I thought, this, I thought you know, the famous New Orleans, this is the famous French Quarter, right? Where, where's the French in this? And, and at this point, I had done a lot of research on Islam, and I'm thinking, 
if I am I going nuts because I'm seeing Islamic, you know, aesthetics here. And in fact, I was surprised to learn they have you see this on the streets of New Orleans that uh, Spain ruled over New Orleans from 1762 to 1803. I did not know that. I did not know that. Um, and it just so happens when they ruled over New Orleans, a lot of uh, fires damaged a lot of buildings there. So a lot of the buildings in New Orleans are actually Spanish style buildings, but they're really Spanish Islamic style. Spanish Islamic style. And again, it goes back to the Alhambra. But the other thing that was shocking to me, this is another uh, photo of New Orleans, is this. Now, why, why would this be shocking to me? Well, because it's, court, it's, a, it's a beautiful courtyard. This is what Spain did. When they ruled over New Orleans, they said, we're going to put in these beautiful courtyard buildings. But of course, this is from the Alhambra. Now, this, but this is where we can't stop, because to me, like history is always telling you, reminding you, it's complicated. It's complicated. So we can't just go back to Spain, of course. We have to go back, that's another, that's another view of a courtyard. We have to go back to this building. Now, any of you want to guess what this building is? This, this is a depiction of what the original, um, an original mosque, this is Mohammed's mosque in Saudi Arabia. It's courtyard. It's courtyard architecture. And this is what happens in history. So Muslim rule over Spain, they get kicked out, but the people who are kicking in us said, we love your architecture, and we're going to adopt it. And when we come to America, we're going to put it in New Orleans. Now again, when you go to New Orleans, there's nothing that says, welcome to the Islam-inspired French Quarter of New Orleans. You don't get that. You don't get that at all. You have to guess, in a sense. And again, it's another example of how things get disconnected. People think of it as the French Quarter, and then, oh, by the way, there's a sign that reminds you, you know, oh, it was Spanish for 40 years, but there's no sign beyond that that says, oh, by the way, they were inspired by Islamic aesthetics. That's what's missing. That's all, that's what's all missing. And so let me, um, and so this, this, this is a church in New Orleans, the Immaculate Conception Church. Now, you know, people who know Islamic architecture will say, of course, those are minarets. Those are minarets. Now, yeah, they, this church did adopt Islamic architectural um, uh, uh, as its kind of motif, minarets. By the way, I do want to say this, um, that minarets actually were adopted from Christianity, uh, from, from according to my research, in Spain, in Syria. This was centuries ago. So in a sense, it's re-adopting. But it's an example of how cultures, again, they borrow from each other. They, it's, it's all about give and take. And so... Um, well, let me, let me pass on these. Um, this is a, a, a map of, you know, when Spain ruled over um, um, this part of the, the United States. I, I, and I want to say, well, these are not aberrations. Let's, you can go back to any part of the world. West Africa, for example, um, people know, of course, about you know, slavery and how, you know, 60%, upwards of 60% of slaves in the United States were from West Africa. Now, um, of course, Islam was, was a, a long... Um, had a, had a long presence in West Africa, and yet, you know, a lot of Americans don't know about Muslim slaves and their um, presence in America, including he, he <coughs> excuse me, Ibrahim Abdul Rahman, Prince of Slaves. He's perhaps the best known Muslim slave in America because um, he, he wrote a book. He met um, at the time he was really well known because he was he was emancipated, and so he met in the White House with this man, John Quincy Adams, and John Quincy Adams said. You know, I'm going to raise, help raise the money for you, which he did, to send you back to West Africa. Here's another well-known uh, Muslim slave, Omar Ibn Said, uh, who wrote his memoir in Arabic. He, a lot of Muslim scholars, of course, know him. I wrote an article on him for the uh, magazine called uh, Ramco World, or Saudi Ramco World. Uh, he's a pretty incredible uh, example of Muslim steadfastness in America. He was asked for years to give up his Muslim identity, he refused. Even though he seemed to convert. He seemed to convert, but he did not. And I'm not going to play it for you here, but there are a lot of Muslim scholars who say that even um, the call to prayer, here's an, here's an example of someone, um, but that even the call to prayer um, helped influence American blues music. How was that? Because a lot of Muslim slaves, when they came to this country, were still had still learned these kind of um, aesthetics, you can say musical aesthetics, they brought them with them. And that when they were in this country, um, they, they would, um, you know, do something called field shouts, field hollers. 
and they would use the same kind of intonations that you get in the call to prayer. In academic language, they call it melisma, melisma, and that's you, it's sort of the wobbling you hear, like in different notes, kind of different notes in the same thing. That melisma you can hear in early blues music. And here's an example of, of uh, an English, um, this is a quote, uh, an, an English, uh, uh, I think he's an, an economist who went to West Africa, and he was saying, oh yeah, um, I, was, I would occasionally see, they would occasionally sing a melancholy song, and they would earnest, uh, you know, utter an earnest prayer. And he saw that he, he thought this was music. He thought, so people outside of Islam who don't know, at that year, in those years, who didn't know anything about it, would, would confuse, in a sense, the call of prayer from music. So, um, but again, there are scholars who say that there is a connection, and they, they, they even say, for example, look at Billie Holiday, you can hear the echoes of Islamic music in her music. So, another, another example, this is just another example, I'm going to skip past these, of, of the, um, that, that, and, and ethnomusicologists, of course, have studied these connections. You get this great book called Africa and the Blues, which goes into all sorts of details. Um, but I want to get into this connection, too. Um, this is Iran. And this is, um, you can't see the last name, but this is a very famous, Ralph Waldo Emerson, right? Very famous philosopher and academic. Um, he's, he's known these days for one of his famous quotes is, a foolish consistency is the hot goblin of little minds. Uh, that quote was actually um, um, directed at George Bush, I'm sorry to say, at, 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 he was in office. Uh, I'm not trying to make this a, a you know, Republican versus Democrat lecture at all. Um, but. Um, I'm just pointing out a fact. Uh, and, he, and here is uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, he, he loved uh, Persian poets. He loves Hafez and Sadi. And in fact, he wrote often um, about their uh, uh, poems. And here's an example. That's the second one. I was as a gem concealed me in my brain. Read. Emerson thought that was from the Quran, but it's actually not. It's from a different book. But it shows you to the extent to which that Emerson looked to the Quran look to it, to Persian poetry and look to it for knowledge. In fact, this to me, this is a really good example because um, Emerson first got interested in Persian poetry, but then the Persian poetry got him interested in Islam. That, so, and again, a lot of people know about uh, this about Ralph Waldo Emerson, but in a sense, he was in love with Persian poetry and by default, you could say Islam, there's an image of Saidi. And here's an example of a book, it's called Bulistan. And when it was first released in the United States, um, Emerson wrote the introduction to it. Now I'm going to get into some sillier examples, but I think it's easily profound. <laughs> this is the guy on the left is P.T. Barnum, and he's famous for Barnum Daily Circus, and that's um, General Tom Thumb. But um, he's a, he's, he was he was America's first billionaire. He was he was America's richest man in the late 1800s, and and I, I have him in here, and I wrote about him because when he um, built this house, this was his house, and he built, he built it in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, wow. You can't see it. You want to guess what he named this house? Oh, um, Alhambra. Uh, Alhambra is a good guess, but no. <laughs> good guess. Uh, he named it Iranistan. <laughs> Iranistan. Now, uh, P.T. Barnum was a wealthy man. He could fly anywhere he wanted, and so he... he built this house after seeing this, the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, England. And, and because P.T. Barnum could essentially get anything he wanted, he said, I want this house. I want to live in this house. And so this, so then he built this, Aradistan. Now, when he saw this house, he thought he was building, I don't know, what was the, what, I don't know what he thought he was building. I think he really thought he was building an Indian house, mm -hmm. house in India. And in fact, he was sort of right, because this, the Brighton, uh, Royal Pavilion in Brighton, England, was inspired by the Taj Mahal. Yeah. That's a fact. Um, now, the Taj Mahal, any of you who've been there and, and know about it, you know, it's, it's essentially a Muslim building, right? These, these are, there's a mosque on the grounds, these, these um, but it's, it, it's Hindu and Islam, in a sense, uh, mixed together. But the Taj Mahal actually was inspired by, guess what? This building, the Imam Mosque in Esfahan, Iran. Now that that's one example, that's one architectural example. This is another, right? So P.T. Barnum didn't know it, but he was actually right to call his building Iranistan because ultimately the architecture goes back to this building. And again, this is the disconnect that people don't know about. Oh yeah, the Taj Mahal, Brighton Pavilion, the Royal Pavilion, Brighton. But no, actually, go farther, a little bit farther. That's when you'll find it. 
This is the source right here. And if you go to Bridgeport, Connecticut, the Arata Stand burnt down, but you will find this. You will find that at Arata Stand Avenue. So um, it's, it, it, you also will find, I know this in the book, you'll find a mosque not far from Arata Stand Avenue. And so even, this is one of the little ironies I found in my research, that you go to where you know, Arata Stand was, you'll find there's now a small but growing Muslim community there. Small but Muslim growing community. Um, just a few more slides, I think. Um, you know, my book gets into the, to the language, the Arabic-influenced English language. Um, giraffe comes from, of course, the Arabic word zarafa. Um, and a lot of these words came through Spain, of course. Alcatraz, a very famous island, of course. When you go to Alcatraz, there's not, no one saying welcome to the you know, Arabic-inspired you know, blah, blah, blah. No one says assalamu alaikum, no one says that. Uh, it comes from, and of course there's a misspelling now, Al Alcatraz. Um, it, owes, it owes its origins to the Arabic word ahatas, which, which, according to my research, originally meant the white-tailed sea eagle. So when Spain came across this island, they saw a lot of birds there. Well, they went Alcatraz. But again, you know, that, that's one example. Here, to me, is, is a really more profound example, though, um, the state of California, right? Now, the state of California, um, you know, any of you want to guess where that name came from? Yeah, I, 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 you're, you're definitely on the right track. Um, there's a very, this is what California looked like on an early map. They thought it was an island. Spaniards who came to this side of the country said, ah, oh, this, this is a great island. And in fact, there was a very famous novel um, at the time of, of you know, this discovery, actually centuries before, really, or decades before, definitely, um, about, uh, uh, and, and it had, it was, it was, it was a, a novel about um, a, um, a, a mythical island full of gold. And the, the island, um, you know, uh, and by, by the way, it's, it's in these history books. This is my son. My son was now 14, but at the time he was, I think, around seven or eight. And this, his book talks about, oh, by the way, you know, California comes, the word California comes from a Spanish novel uh, that uses the name California. But they don't say that that novel bases California on the, on the word caliph or caliph. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that in the novel, it's all about this island full of gold, an island full of this and that. But there's all sorts of references to caliph and Islam, and it's incredible. So, so when California is named, it really comes from Islam. We live in the state of Islam, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now you, you, you can take that anyway. Those of you who are Muslim will agree with that, of course. <laughs> but, but California, much to my surprise, also, here's a, here's a more profound, you know, you can argue which one of these is more profound. I'm not going to get into how relatively profound each one of these examples is. But again, to me, hey, mom, guess what? We live in the state of Islam. What do you mean by that? Well, the California comes from the word that ultimately derives from the word caliph or caliph. I didn't know that. Well, I, you know, I, I didn't know that either until I researched this book. Um, yeah, that's just... Uh, okay. Now, um, I, do, I did know from my years of research in journalism that in the you know, earlier centuries, 19th century, 18th century, um, the Prophet Muhammad was, was referred to as Muhammad. And if you go to Muhammad, Illinois, and you ask people there, wow, this is the only city in America that's named after the Muslim prophet Muhammad, peace be upon you. They, they will say, what are you talking about? And that's what they told me. And I talked to someone who was from Muhammad, Illinois, who said, how dare I refer to that city uh, as, as something related to the prophet Muhammad. But this is a fact, actually. This is a fact. Now, I didn't research this well enough, but... You can say to your friends and enemies, if you want, America has a city named after the Prophet Muhammad. That, that's a fact. Um, now, I will say, this is a fun fact. You can say that the ice cream cone, this, this is a, a, a very well-known story, um, that, that um, the ice cream cone derives from the 1904 World's Fair, and it derives from uh, a Dumar who was at the fair, who was from Syria, who... Uh, um, Ice cream was sold at the fair, and there's this Syrian um, flat, you could say bread or whatever, called Zalabia, and that he had the idea of, of um, kind of, you know, changing the shape and putting ice cream in there, and thus was born the ice cream cone. Now, Abe Dumar is a Christian Syrian, right? And my book, you know, is, is about Arab roots as well. And here's an example of how, you know, the Dumar 
uh, legacy lives on. And so, and it made me think, wow, this is a, this is a silly example, but I think it's a good example, uh, again, of this cultural interconnectedness. Cultural interconnectedness. Um, the, I'm sure some of you know the Shriners, who are, whose original name was the Ancient Arabic Order of the Nobles of the Mystic Shrine. They're, they're very much an Orientalist group, and um, you know my publisher decided to put it on the cover of my book for whatever reason. Um, that, that's fine. Um, but they, they, had some, they had such an ingrained history that this guy was a member of the Shriners. And those of you who are older, like I am, they recognize him. Yeah, Dig or Hoover. Um, he was a Shriner, so he wore a fez on his head. Uh, he wasn't, by the way, Jager Hoover wasn't a real fan of Islam, I can tell you that much, for a fact. Um, uh, especially Malcolm X, but that's a whole other chapter. It's a whole other chapter. Um, but as another fun fact, Warren Harding was also, uh, he was the president around 1921, he was also a Shriner. And in my research, uh, a bunch of Shriners went up to the White House, it's hard to believe now, they went up to the sh to the White House around 1920 when Harding was president and they said, Salam Aleikum. They said that in mass and mass. And Harding said, what do you think he said in return? Yeah, Wa Alaikum Salam. So it's just, it, you know, did he know his, he was saying, yeah, I think he did know what he was saying, but again, you know, Arabic, you know, Orientalist culture, whatever, it has a way of seeping into the culture and it's hard to imagine that a hundred years ago there was speaking Arabic from the White House in this very, you could say, sort of silly way, but it, it, you know, it's, it's a way nevertheless. I'm gonna go past this for now. Um, now, uh, how many of you recognize, anyone recognize these guys? Yeah, The Doors, The Doors. I've loved the music of The Doors. Um, I interviewed Ray Mandera, the keyboardist at the very, very bottom. And why would I interview him for this book I wrote? Why on earth would I interview him? Well, here's, here's why, because when I hear um, songs like um, the end, and those of you who know the girls' music will know the end. When I hear that, I hear Arabic musical influence. Now, I didn't know that, but at the time, and I'm listening with my son, I say, you know what, I have to find out because I'm a curious journalist. Like, I'm going to write this guy. And I wrote him a letter saying, hi, Mr. Manderic, I'm writing a book on the connection between Arabic music and American, you know, 60s music. Can you talk to me? He said, yeah, absolutely, I will. And here's what he said, much to my surprise. He said the Arabic minor harmonic sense is an endemic part of the Doors music. <laughs> now he also said um, rock and roll and Arabic music, you know, they, they, they're great together, and we have to get together with Islam. Now he, he told me that, and and I was bowled over by that, really bowled over by that. Um, and he passed away a couple years ago, but it's a sh it's a shame. And and um, those of you who really know the Doors music will know the song. I'm blanking on the name. But it, um, I think when the music's over, and, it's, and, it, and it has a lyric in it that goes, you know, Persian Nights, babe, you know, that's one of the lines. And Ray Manzarek says that's, a, that's an over-reference to Islam, over-reference to Islam. So it's, it's hard, I mean, those of you who um, know how Jim Morrison died and just how he died tragically, it, it would be incredible to imagine Jim Morrison during his life to say from the concert, you know, you know, we owe a debt of, you know, uh, 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 we, we owe, we're, we're great, we're, we're, we're such a, we owe so much to the Muslim world, you know, this song is devoted to blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't it be great if, if people like Ray, you know, Jim Morrison said that in popular culture? But they don't, of course. And again, it's, this is an example, you know, how many people have read my book and know this? Probably relatively few. And I think if more people knew about the connection between the doors, and it's not just the doors, it's Arabic music everywhere. Um, and and, and um, Robbie Krieger, there, he's a, uh, a guitar player with a sarod. He loved Indian music, and of course, there's a connection between Indian music and Arabic music. Uh, sympathetic music, sympathetic strings in, on the sitar are called karab. Um, and and he was very into, Robbie Krieger was very into uh, flamenco music, which of course is influenced by Arabic music. Um, and of course, you know those of you who know this Pulp Fiction. We'll hear the song, I don't know how many, I, I can't play it for you, but the song called Miserloo. Any of you know that song by this guy, Dick Dale? Okay, yeah. So that's the song. Um, now, Dick Dale, here's a good example of how, again, disconnected. Dick Dale's real name is Richard Mansour. And he, he's one half Polish and one half Lebanese, right? And so Miserloo means the Egyptian. It means the Egyptian. Uh, Masur means, it's, it, it's the Arabic word for Egypt. Um, in my research, you know, this guy, Elvis Presley, 
Um, now, this this is um, how many of you have been to Graceland in Memphis? A few, a few of you. Well, I mean, uh, Elvis Presley loved Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. He wanted to make a movie out of it. He wanted he wanted to make a movie out of that, and he had The Prophet on his nightstand when he passed away. So again, a small example, but I think a relevant example of how even people in popular culture, you know, like Elvis Presley, loved Khalil Gibran on the past of this. And then, you know, of course, I know a lot of you know the Eat Stamp, which came out just before 9 11. And I interviewed, this is the uh, Muhammad Zakaria, who drew the stamp. Very famous calligrapher, very famous. And I have to say, he's a Muslim, he converted to Islam in his probably, I think, his 30s. And he, the reason I bring him up right now is that um, he was also a tattooist when he was in his 20s, before he was Muslim. He was a tattooist, right? And so I asked him a lot of questions like, well, well Muhammad, you know, how does tattooing relate to calligraphy? He goes, of course, there's great relation. In fact, you know, um, you know, and then he said, I even have tattoos on my body. I go, but Muhammad, that's against Islam, you know, you're supposed to get rid of those. And he goes, Jonathan, there's no use crying over spilled milk. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my, I'm sorry. But, but the, re the, reason, the reason that comes up now is that, you know, here's an example of someone who, uh, had, you know, adopted Arabic on her right arm. And this, the Arabic she adopted was al az azaban and probably maybe I'm mispronouncing it. It means strength of character, strength of will. You want to guess who has this or had this on her right arm? Angelina Jolie. Yeah, Angelina Jolie, exactly. So, but um, I'm just going to go back to this. You, you find all sorts of examples in, in the culture, like this guy, Akbar from Star Wars, Admiral Akbar, Admiral the Great. But I, I want to go back to something because the first image I showed you was of these <coughs> twin towers. Um, and these are the twin towers. And you can see how Minoru Yamasaki, this very famous architect, uh, created the Twin Towers, and at the base of the towers you can see these spirals that he made. These are inspired by Islam. These were at the base of the World Trade Center towers that were destroyed on 9-11. Now why would Minoru Yamasaki do that? Because Minoru Yamasaki uh, was a fan of Islamic architecture, and if you go to Dabran, Saudi Arabia, uh, this is a, and, uh, he built this airport terminal in the 1950s in Saudi Arabia. He built the World Trade Center in the, 19th, in the late 60s. And so you can see the connection between this, the Islamic spirals there and there. Now, uh, and, and this, again, we saw this building earlier. This is the Shah's Mosque or the Imam Mosque in Esfahan. This was Minoru Yamasaki's favorite building. He was asked by the New York Times, what's your favorite building in the world? This was his favorite building. And so the Islamic, you know, again, the World Trade Center destroyed on 9-11, ironically enough, was built with Islam at its base. And here is, here is Minori Yamasaki. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this talk uh, on a personal note. When, I, when I, I did a fellowship at Oxford University in 2005 and 6, and it was about Islamic architecture, and I went to this town, and I, if anyone guesses where this town is, I will give you all sorts of stuff. Granada? <laughs> Granada? <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, it's a town in France. <laughs> Leon? No, it's a very good guess, though. It's, it's about an hour or two from Leon, but... Was that? Is Village of No, that's a really good... That's another one. Wow. Um, okay, I don't have to give my whole life away. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's Le Puy. Le Puy en Valais is its name. It's Le Puy. Now, why, why is this town important? Because in the 11th century, this is one of the towns where the Crusades emanated from. We had people in this town who said, you know, we're going to go to Jerusalem, we're going to get rid of the Muslims from the Holy Land. From this town, they said, we are going to rid, you know, essentially the world of Islam, right? Now, why, why, why would I go to the Pui for my research on Islamic architecture? Because if you go to the, very, the most famous uh, building there, this is the cathedral there, this is not a good image of it, but if you walk up the steps and you go to this huge doorway, you'll find Arabic writing there, Kufic writing. And why is that writing there? Because in the 11th century, despite the Crusades, despite people at the highest level saying, we will not do business with Spain and Muslims, at the more profound cultural level, of course there was business happening between Muslims and non-Muslims in Europe. Of course there was. Coins were minted. You know, they were, they, were, they were sent back and forth. And so Arabic writing was, ironically enough, or whatever, unironically enough, 
in the very cathedral from which the Crusades happened. This, to me, was a very profound experience for me, because you realize, again, I said this at the very beginning, at the higher level, you have people saying, we're at war with fill in the blank, we're at war with Islam, we're at war with this, but really, at the more profound one-to-one -one level, people are people, and we mix with each other, and we take back and forth, we go back and forth. And so, that's why, this is not in my book, but that's why this was one of the many profound experiences of my life, that even during the Crusades, at the very human level, Islam is integrating in crusader towns in France. And it's still there. The evidence is still there. And I will, I will, I will, um, I know, you know, most of you know this. This is the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, one of the holiest buildings in Islam. It borrowed its architectural dimensions from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Its octagonal dimensions were taken from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and then it moved on. And again, this is an example of how cultures always go back and forth. Islam borrows from other cultures, cultures borrow from Islam. It's, it's a two-way street, and I will end my talk this way. Um, Nazar Kabani, a great Syrian diplomat and writer, saying that any culture should be open to all other cultures. Uh, it should affect them and be affected by them continuously. Culture should strive to bring the world together in unified streams. This, to me, is my mantra. This is one of my mantras. This is what I live for. Because I don't. When you believe, when you live in a world of absolutes, you're saying Islam is this, and then we're not. Judaism is this, and that's that. When in fact, you know, we're all mixing together architecturally, linguistically, musically, uh, food-wise, you name it. I, you know, I, I, I told. Um, I was saying. I was saying. You know, to Professor earlier, I was raised Jewish. But in a sense, at this point, I feel as much connected to Islam as I do with Judaism, and, I, and with other cultures. I'm not, I'm not just limited to one. I, I'm looking to other cultures for inspiration, for stories, for other things, just as the way other cultures have done forever, and will do forever. So that, that's my talk. Thank you. Open it up for questions for, for Jonathan uh, right now, and then and the will also ask uh, Ali Atai and Imam Khar to come up and take broader questions. Please. What's the name of your book? Uh, it's called All America Travels Through America's Arab and Islamic Roots. Which should ask me? Uh, Kuriel. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you know about it. I don't know if you included it in your book, but many of the names we use for stars yes. in oh. the West <laughs> Thank are, you. are primarily given by the uh, Arabic astronomers. No, absolutely, and, and that, that is, um, you know, that's, in, in, in the academic world, especially the world of science, of course, they, that, that yet is acknowledged more readily than it is outside of that world. Sure. Um, if you get, and in science, yeah, there, there's a huge indebtedness there, and, it, and it, it's not going away, it will never go away, whereas, you know, the, 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 in a sense, the culture I write about is, is more popular culture, even though that does get, you know, that does kind of seed a little bit into popular culture, but yes. Ah, uh, yes, please, yeah. Uh, thank you for your uh, research. It's very well uh, documented, very well researched. Uh, there's one aspect that I feel missing, mm -hmm. uh, and that is the impact of the Holy Quran mm -hmm. on the Constitution of the United States. Mm -hmm. Did you get a chance to uh, do any research on that? You know, as if he's asking about the influence of the Holy Quran on the, on the Constitution. Yeah. Right? Um, not as much as I wanted to. I, I think a lot of people know that Thomas Jefferson uh, studied the Quran. Uh, and actually, according, according to my research, studied Arabic and learned to, to, to write a little bit of Arabic. Um, but I, no, that was not a, a, a huge um, you know, connection for me to research, I'm afraid. Um, even though I think it's an important connection to to help, you know, elaborate on, absolutely elaborate on.